Hello, everyone, and welcome to our session today. I will be going over a quick um, presentation to welcome you all and introduce you to our program and various opportunities if you have, of course, not previously attended one of our shadowing sessions. That is, of course, right before we begin. Um, we do want to highlight that Prehill Shadowing is a student-led, minority-led, women-led nonprofit dedicated to helping prospective healthcare professionals gain access to educational resources, no matter their demographic status, abilities, or location. My name is Jesus. I am the Chief of Program Planning here at Prehealth Shadowing, and I want to thank you all for coming today. So let's get started. Just a little PSA, we do have closed captioning for all of our sessions to accommodate all students. This setting is available on the bottom of your Zoom screen. If you need assistance enabling the transcript, please direct message one of our team members. We are always looking for ways to be more inclusive and ensure our sessions are accessible to everyone. So please, if you have any recommendations whatsoever for how we can improve, you can email us at info at freehillshadowing.com. So, since this is an international program, we want to know, where are you guys Zooming from today? You can drop it in the chat. Wonderful, I see you guys are okay. That's wonderful, thank you so much. I, myself, am calling from the wonderful island of Puerto Rico in the Caribbean. Let's keep going. If you want to stay in the loop, you can follow us on social media. We are active on both Instagram and TikTok, or you can also sign up for our email list on our website to never miss a session. I do apologize for the barking dogs on the back. <laughs> We have some wonderful opportunities for you all as benefits of being part of our program. Number one, we have partnered with Kaplan to, get our, to give our students a 10% discount code that can be used on all Kaplan products as well as free resources such as study guides to help prepare, for, uh, to help prepare you for standardized tests like the MCAT, the NCLEX, or the PCAT as well. If you fill out our short survey in the chat, we will get in sign up for these deals as well. Also, we would like to draw your attention to another amazing program. That is Neolith right over here. Neolith is an online mental health program for students. For pre-health professionals especially, we know that the path isn't easy, and that is why we have partnered with Neolith to spread the word and offer free access to their services if you use the link in the chat or enter the code PREHEALTH when signing up. Mask for Mask is another amazing women-led organization that donates four masks for every four masks sold. These go to people in need during the COVID-19 pandemic. Those in the homeless community, for example, healthcare workers without their protective equipment, and others who are struggling to stay safe. With our discount code PHS15, you can get 15% off your order. If you buy through this method, pre health shadowing will also get 10% of the proceeds, which is amazing because as I mentioned earlier, we are a nonprofit that runs solely of our support of our community. If by any chance you want to play a bigger part in supporting PHS, we would love for you to, be, to join our network of student volunteers and team members. You can apply to be part of our administrative team and lead students in various projects and initiatives with professional outreach, grant writing, and much more. We understand, of course, that as a pre-health student, you may not have the time. So we also offer the opportunity to volunteer asynchronously with tasks that can be done on your own time. We would love to have you be part of our team and contribute your own unique perspective so you guys can think about it. Good news, if you are a high school student and want to get involved, we have started a program called HTP or high school training for PHS, which allows you to connect with college pre-health programs, get involved in fundraising for PHS, and organize resources for other high school students interested in medicine through pre-health shadowing. 
we of course always want to recognize the hard work of our of our students in the program so if you are interested in getting published you can submit essays reflections research papers and reviews to our editor-in-chief through the link dropped in the chat to have your work on our website this will definitely look great on cvs applications resumes etc so do take advantage of it if you will Part of our mission here at PHS is to promote diversity. And in order to do this, we have launched an initiative to have monthly panels to celebrate different demographics in the field of medicine. Some of these upcoming events include a series of, on patient experiences, a COVID-19 roundtable, and International Student Forum. If you have a mentor, professor, or professional that has inspired you in any way, and you think they can contribute to these conversations, Please nominate them today using the link in the chat. If you can, we humbly ask that you donate to our program. As you know, and I mentioned earlier, pre-health shattering is completely student run, and we are working around the clock to keep this free and accessible to everyone. Unfortunately, Zoom and our website are not free, so any contribution you can give would be greatly appreciated. If you are not financially able, we request you send this link to someone you think can, so we can continue to support those who cannot afford similar opportunities. Um, throughout this session, we encourage you to drop any questions you have for the speaker in the chat. Our team members will be making note of these to be asked in the latter half of the session on the Q&A. I do want to remind you all to take good notes as a professional is going over their presentation, as there will be the chance to take a post shadowing assessment to verify your virtual shadowing hours. More information will be available on this at the end of the session, so stay tuned. Lastly, if you can, we request you turn your cameras on. This is by no means an obligation, as we are respectful of different circumstances, but it does help us feel closer together in a time when social distancing is mandatory. Once again, I appreciate you all for listening. And now I would like to welcome Dr. Chico. Thank you for joining us today. You may share your screen whenever you feel ready. Thank you, Jesus. I will try to share my screen. Okay, can everyone see my screen that says Anatomy of Becoming a Medical Educator? Yes, it looks wonderful. Wonderful, thank you. I want to say um, welcome to everyone and thank you for your time uh, this morning, this afternoon, or this evening, depending on your time zone. And just also in, in terms of inclusivity, just to let you know how I, how I appear for those who won't have their video on. I, have, I wear glasses. I have black hair with a little bit of streak of uh, white gray on my uh, left side of my face and my hair is up to the length of my shoulder. I am wearing a black sweater over um, a yellowish uh, um, tank top, but you can't really see it on my um, video, but I just wanted to have that as a part of inclusion because inclusion and inclusive, creating an inclusive climate is a major component of what being an educator and or a teacher is in ensuring the success of our students. For what am I, so what am I gonna talk about in terms of this virtual shadowing? I will be talking about the anatomy of becoming a medical educator. And that might give you a hint of the area that I actually teach in in medical school. Just a little bit in terms of what my background is, I am, uh, faculty holding a rank of full professor at, the, at Texas A&M um, College of Medicine that's located in the uh, Bryan College Station, Texas area. I am in two departments, the Department of Medical Education, of which I uh, currently am now the full department head, and I also hold a joint appointment with the Department of Neuroscience and Experimental Therapeutics. So before we go any further, I wanted to uh, give you just an overview of what this presentation focus will include. Just a little bit of a brief history of my journey, a day in the life of what I do at Texas A&M, and then just give you some um, ideas of how to start your journey if you are interested in academic medicine. 
So for today, I also will have some questions. So if you have a computer or text, um, I will have some se several questions using Poll Everywhere. So you may log in using your computer um, at pollev.com backslash dchico, which is my first initial last name, or you could text me if you prefer uh, my first initial last name to 22333. Three, three. So those are going to be some questions that I would like to ask. Now then, let's start about my journey. So one of the things that I do, which is very, very important in, in my professional development is to reflect on how, the things that I have done in the past and ref, so that it'll help me to achieve what I wish to do in the future. So looking through the lens uh, and this as this image depicts of a windy river because for the most part, my journey really wasn't a straight path. It was just based on the doors that were open to me in order to achieve my goals. So what do I mean by that? Growing up in, in my childhood, I was actually interested in forensic science. Uh, my parents uh, studied criminology in, their, in college. And so I got into their, their textbooks, one of them that showed me the, uh, the uh, human body. And so I was so interested in being able to investigate what is going on in the world. And so being a forensic science is what a, a forensic scientist is what interested me the most. And so when I decided to think about what do I want to do going to college as I studied, anatomy, human anatomy is what interested me. And so when I thought about human anatomy and when I went to school and college in the 1990s, one of the things that brought to mind was um, biology, but at the institution that I attended, the best way for me to be able to, to uh, get experience with a broader range of biological sciences was to join the pre-med program. So the pre-med program was more of an opportunity for me to attend classes that I probably wouldn't have attended if I didn't select the pre-med track. So you could, ex you, could attend, you could attend the pre-med track, but you don't necessarily have to go to medicine. So where did I go to college? I grew up for the most part in Texas. My dad was um, career military in the US Army. And after graduating from high school here in Texas, I attended this very small university in Austin, Texas. So when you hear Austin, you'll most likely think of University of Texas at Austin. This is actually St. Edwards University, the Hilltoppers, as I like to, I like to say is what I would represent as an undergrad. Um, this, is, this building, the main building is really uh, quite distinctive of St. Edwards University. And when I was at St. Edwards, I actually majored in biology following the pre-med track because it allowed me to be able to, to, uh, to take a lot more classes in the sciences, in biology and chemistry, going all the way up to organic chemistry and uh, some of the more advanced courses such as uh, histology. Now then, if you look at the image towards the right, you can see several of the religion um, that's listed over here. What does that mean? What that means is that I'm the type of person who really wants to know what is going on, why am I doing certain things? And so what I ended up doing is I decided to minor in religious studies. And this is because it was more a matter of a personal interest of mine. And so when I, whenever I advise um, children of my, for my colleagues or relatives and they ask me, what, do, what should I take in college? I always ask them, what's your career path? What are you aiming for? And then, um, then I ask them to, what are your interests? So you could take a major, do a major related to your career, but don't forget to do something that you are interested in. And so I was actually one, in fact, I was the first person at St. Edward's University to have both a major in the sciences and a minor in religious studies, because at that time there were some there was some thought that how can you blend or mesh in sciences with religion? In many cases, what you're thinking about is the thought process. Science allows you to be able to think logically, to be able to 
see the mysteries really and start to ask questions of what's going on. Whereas religion, you bring in philosophy, you bring in the theoretical framework of why is this happening? And when you think about the theoretical framework of why things are happening, being able to go beyond just the logical ABC of certain frameworks, then a person is able to look beyond the box, beyond the borders of the sciences. And so that is what was important to me. So when I graduated from St. Edwards University, I then decided to go to the University of Texas Medical Branch in Galveston, uh, UTMB for short. It is the first state university in the state of Texas. Uh, it was established around 1900. And while I was there at UTMB, my degree plan was in the cell biology program. And aside from being a cell biology um, graduate student, I also had, I suppose you could consider it a minor in growth anatomy. So I was so ecstatic when my graduated, graduate advisor told me that he was actually one of the course directors for growth anatomy. And so when he learned of my interest in growth anatomy and um, letting him know that yes, after I graduated from, from UTMB, I wanted to then go into uh, go into forensic science research and spend most of my time in that area, he invited me to take gross anatomy with the medical students. And so that provided me the exposure of looking at the anatomical sciences and being able to rate that, uh, relate that to clinical scenarios. I like to show this image because this image is the Ashbell Red Smith, the Ashbell uh, Red um, Smith building we call it affectionately old red because of the color of the stone. And where you see these nice, uh, lovely windows, the third floor, that is where um, the gross anatomy uh, laboratory was held. And this is an image of an old time, relatively old time um, auditorium where we would hold some of our lectures or some of our, our um, uh, end of unit games to help in reinforcement of the content. Uh, regretfully, after Hurricane Ike um, hit Galveston several years ago, um, we were no longer able to use this laboratory for uh, gross, gross anatomy, but we were able to convert one of the old pharmacology buildings. But if you ever have a chance to visit the coast and Galveston, this would be a nice area to visit just to see the, um, to see the uh, building. And during that time in, in, uh, at UTMB, I wasn't really a very uh, normal, so to speak, a cell biology graduate student. Uh, I did work with uh, cell cultures. I did work with animal models, but I mostly worked with um, peptide chemistry, being able to look at how to, to um, modify these peptides in order to be able to translocate them or transfer them across barriers that would be challenging, such as the blood-brain barrier. So even though my degree plan was in cell biology, a lot of my research was really more peptide chemistry. And so after I graduated from UTMB, I then did a postdoctoral training at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine in Bronx, New York. And there I continued my training in biochemistry. And so I, Performed, I continued performing post translational modification, especially working with oxidative, um, oxidative mechanisms in the Department of Biochemistry with my advisor. But at the same time, there was uh, the Department of Anatomy and Structural Biology, where my colleagues, my advisors at UTMB, um, knew the head of the uh, the uh, Department of Anatomy and Structural Biology faculty member. And I should point out too that when I was at UTMB, aside from learning how to um, observe and dissect and understand the human body, both grossly with gross anatomy and, and um, the microanatomy with histology, I learned how to teach. That is my first foray into teaching my peers, not only medical students, but also graduate students and allied health students, physical um, therapists, occupational therapists, as well as physician assistants. And during that time when I was doing research and teaching it as well, 
I started to build up my confidence and my experience in teaching. And so when my, um, when my advisor learned that I was going to Albert Einstein College of Medicine, they contacted the uh, course director with, at, at uh, Einstein for gross anatomy and mentioned, if you need someone to teach in the course, this is someone you could, you could ask. And so after being invited to teach in the uh, course at Einstein College of Medicine, I had been teaching in that course throughout my, my period of postdoctoral training. And so this represents uh, my teaching my teaching experience, um, most, mostly in the laboratory component, as well as small, small sessions at Einstein. Now then, what did I do afterwards? After four years of training in, in my um, postdoctoral position, one of the things that came up is I recognized I found more and more interest in being able to interact with students. But most importantly, what came to me and really called to my passion was the fact that I am impacting their ability to learn the material, being able to learn in different styles. And so after my stint at Einstein College of Medicine, my first job, so to speak, after my training as a faculty member was returning to the University of Texas Medical Branch. And so this, is, this just represents, uh, first off, the seawall. That is a characteristic of um, Galveston in the area that I lived. Oops. And I have dual screen, so I'm trying to find my, my cursor. Where did my cursor go? And then this one over here, this building is the medical research building where I, my office was held. This is also where I did my graduate research. And this is, uh, this is a rep this st uh, structure and statue is a representation of UTMB in front of the, um, in front of the uh, uh, library. So I returned back full circle from my graduate education where I first learned how to uh, how to uh, teach gross anatomy and, and the anatomical sciences. And my first job as a faculty member at UTMB. So through this journey, one of the things that I constant, constantly learned is I need to be open to the unexpected because I had such a defined role of, I want to be a forensic scientist. I want to be able to work in investigation, work and interact with the law enforcement and with the, uh, um, with the attorneys to help to investigate, investigate crimes that have been happening. So this represents, these pelvic uh, bones represents my interest in forensic science. And forensic science is actually the foundations of what led me to my interest in the anatomical sciences. So my education, this is a summary of my education in terms of my major with a minor. Um, from St. Edward University, followed by my um, graduate studies in cell biology at um, UTMB, and then postdoctoral training in biochemistry at, um, at Einstein. But my graduate and my postdoctoral training also gave me the opportunity to learn how to teach, to be confident in myself, to be able to speak in front of 200 students during that time. And so my job right now that I really love is in teaching. And this represents, the, the skeleton represents my teaching in gross anatomy, as well as histology, because here at Texas A&M, we use virtual histology in teaching the course. So from my childhood dream of forensic science to the goal of becoming a competent medical educator is a path that I never thought I had wanted, but I kept myself open to the unexpected. So then let's be prepared for a question that I would like to ask you. As you are right now, which of the following best describes you? Learner. Everyone are learners, support, 
You could answer more than once. Mentor, role model. One of the things to keep in mind is you are every one of those. Even at my age, I am constantly learning, learning how to do things, especially when it comes to uh, technology. But at, as, a, as a high school student, as an undergraduate student, you're also a mentor. You may not see it, but when you have your peers or near peers or those who are um, in the lower grades as uh, from where you are right now and they're asking you question, asking guidance on what to do, whether it's in sports, whether it's in, in um, extracurricular activities or whether it's in your academics, you are helping to mentor each other, which also ties in with supporting your peers and supporting each other. And especially if you have um, younger siblings, younger relatives, or again, if you have um, classmates who are in a lower grade than you, you are also serving as a role model. And in fact, what's listed over here, a learner, a mentor, a role model, and support are actually um, descriptions that also describe who I am. And why do I say that? Before I respond to why I say that is, when you think about being an educator, what do you think are the roles of an educator? No multiple choice here. <laughs> Let's lay. Let's lay. Good boy. Let's keep the door open. Challenge. Can I sit with you? Oh, hi, sweetie. It is. If you start to recognize it, the roles I mentioned are asked about in the entire uh, slide represents all that you are indicating here as roles of an educator. When you are teaching others and you are helping to guide them and inspire them, that is the role of an educator. So when you think about that, thank you very much for your responses. When you think about that, the question I have is why medical education? That speaks to what I do or what I what my background is. So I've been alluding to gross anatomy. I've been alluding to histology. So my background is, yes, it includes biochemistry, but when it comes to my passion and teaching and educating and guiding others, it's in the anatomical sciences. And medical education refers to the fact that it's related to content in the health professions which all of you are thinking of going into. But one thing I want you to know right now is when you decide that you want to be a medical educator, you don't necessarily have to be an anatomist. It's what um, profession you're in. You can be a DO, a PhD, an MD, a PharmD, um, the, uh, um, an, an EDD uh, person with an um, uh, doctorate in education can also be involved in medical education. Nurses, physical therapists, physician assistant. There are so many, so many professions in the health field where you can serve as a medical education. What I'm telling you right now is more of an example of how I became involved in medical education. And so this is important to me because it is important to the learners that I am serving because they in turn, what you will be doing in the future are serving the community, serving the, the uh, patients and the public in a manner that I cannot serve them. I can only help our learners learn the foundational information but you yourselves are the individuals who will be impacting our community a lot more deeply. Now, what are some of the roles of a medical educator? It's actually the same roles as an educator overall. As an educator, I do more than just teach new skills, new information. 
I help to identify our learners um, opportunities for a successful learning environment. It's one of the reason why creating an inclusive climate for learning is very, very important to my colleagues and myself because we want our students to succeed. We also facilitate communication amongst our students, students to student, faculty to student, student to um, staff members, as well as collaboration. Because when you think of the health professions overall, we are all working together as a team in order to co and collaborate with each other for the betterment of our patients. And we also provide a support as an, um, promote an infrastructure of support. Because remember what you showed me and what you wrote on what the roles of an educator is? I saw guidance, I saw support. And so that support is related to mentoring, but it also relates to advocacy. When you support each other, you're advocating for each other. And that's a very good thing because then you're going to advocate as well for your patients. What are some of the opportunities as a medical educator? As a medical educator, aside from teaching your specialty, whether you go into orthopedics, surgery, family medicine, and a specialty in gastroenterology, for example, or teaching gross anatomy or biochemistry, microbiology, immunology, what you're do doing is you're going to then contribute to the development and implementation of innovative educational initiatives. As a student right now, as a learner, you already know this is the best way for me to teach. Now, if I'm in the role of my teacher, of my instructor, how can I best teach the course? So that is one way for you to start to think about developing ways and, and innovative teaching. So even as a student, as a learner, you have that opportunity to do so. The reason why I state that is because one of our M3 medical students here at Texas A&M, he created, uh, along with the help and aid of an animator, created a milestone video on baby steps. Um, that's now posted on YouTube and has already view been viewed at least 167 times. He created that because he wanted to help his colleagues learn the milestones, the pediatric milestones related to, related to infants and children. And so he based it on his experience and then he created an, a project that is now distributed and, and available pretty much worldwide. And so that is what a person's role is as an educator in general. We also contribute to the development of future leaders in, in the health professions field. If you remove the adjective medical and just put opportunities as an educator, regardless of what your area of specialty is, an educator, again, is more than just instructing and promoting how to learn new skills but you are developing the future leaders, providing them the inspiration and the guidance to achieve what their goals are. And also it helps um, myself, for example, to broaden my view of the functioning of a health profession, professional organization. If I'm just a teacher, I just come in, per, per give a, a PowerPoint or a didactic session, laboratory session on a topic such as say, associated glands, of the digestive system and I don't do anything else, I'm not, I'm just helping in a one dimensional arena. But when you are invested in the learning of, in the learning and the uh, growth, especially the professional growth of your students, you're also helping to um, broaden your view of the organization because I'm in a medical school. I could teach gross anatomy at the undergraduate level. I could teach it at any other um, um, professions. But as an educator in a medical school, I have to be very much aware of why is it important for a physician whose who's, uh, specialty is in family medicine versus a physician who's in psychiatry need to know the gross anatomy, need to know the function and physiology of the whole human body. So that's the first thing I need to recognize. And then at the same time, I need to recognize how best can we guide our students to um, 
achieve their goals of becoming a, a, um, a professional in the health profession, in this case, medical school. So what does it mean in terms of my skills? How do my skills align with being an educator? I am broad-minded. I am open to uh, feedback. I am open to learning so many different things. And most importantly, I am open to learning how our students learn because there are so many different ways of teaching. I'm also objective. I have to be able to know and see what is going on without being biased. And that's one of the things that was, uh, I'll tell you right now, was also a challenge when I first became an educator. Because at first it's no, everything was black and white. And so sometimes that viewpoint of things being black and white can lead me to be subjective in how I interacted with others. So by removing that black and white thought process and being able to become objective with what's going on, especially when it comes to how a student is trying to learn certain concepts, that removes any unintentional biases that I may have. And then as an educator, I am helping to guide our learners. We're in a professional school, medical school. This is, all professional schools are very challenging. Our students, when they enter into a professional school, regardless of the health profession, that was their decision to come into the health profession. And so I have to hold myself accountable. I need to hold myself accountable for the information that they learn because they are going to then be impacting the lives of their patients. I, can't afford, I cannot afford to give them the wrong information where it might eventually lead to harming their patients. So as an educator, I'm accountable, um, not only to the students, but also to the organization that I work in. So then with all of this that I mentioned, what does my life involve? A day in my life um, is quite, uh, quite busy. But there are times that I do want to find some, um, some peace. So this, uh, I am involved in teaching as an educator. I teach in the anatomical sciences. I am a servant. I serve um, the uh, uh, College of Medicine as well as outreach. And based on my teaching, I also do scholarly work. And due to my role and what I am involved in, I also have leadership roles in the organization, in this case, Texas a and But one thing, first and foremost, aside from being an educator, is that I am a faculty. I'm a faculty at uh, Texas A&M College of Medicine in the Department of Medical Education and Neuroscience and Experimental Therapeutics. So I am a teacher. I am also a course director. I help lead with my co-course director um, a course, in this case is uh, Foundation of Medicine One, which is an integration of histology and physiology. I am also a mentor, a mentor not only to our students, but to some of our post our postdocs and our faculty, especially our early career faculty. And I'm also a researcher. But my focus now, instead of bench research, my focus is in educational research assessing the, uh, um, the impact of the practices we use to help to teach our students. So when I think of faculty, it's not just one dimensional, it's actually multiple areas that we are involved in. Right. Now then, a few questions for several of you. Just out of curiosity, have you taken or are you taking or will take a course in gross anatomy? As you're thinking, um, you see here an image of our gross anatomy laboratory at Texas A&M. And so our medical gross anatomy course involves the dissecting component. 
meaning that our students will be dissecting our anatomical donors as their first patient in order to learn the uh, relationships of the anatomy structures from a 3D perspective. So it doesn't look like anyone is interested in uh, taking gross anatomy. Okay, now what about this question? How about histology? Okay, that's great to see that uh, there are some who wish to take it, who plan to, and some who aren't taking uh, at this time. So histology is the study of the microstructures, the microanatomy, as we know, and it is actually looking at sections of our tissues. This is actually a useful, if you have the opportunity to take it in college, or um, this is actually a useful course because it allows you to view the tissues microscopically, but it's also helpful for those who are going to, if you are in the health profession so you get a report from a pathologist, you'll be able to know what they're talking about. Now, the reason why I ask that question is, as a teacher, as an educator, one of the things that I, um, I strive to do is to promote an active learning environment. And I also integrate disciplines, especially in the areas that I teach. So I'll just give you an example of walking through a vignette, a type of question that we would do with our students. Now, I just want to point out here at our college, our students, when they first matriculate in uh, medical school as a uh, first year, um, aside from our practice of medicine course, they will be taking two large um, courses, basic sciences courses, the medical gross anatomy, as well as the foundations of medicine course. And those are two lab intensive courses. Since I teach them both, I oftentimes will integrate both the histology and the gross anatomy that I teach. So then, let me ask you this question. As you notice, I don't you oftentimes use multiple choice. I like to use free answer to get our students to be able to think through the process. So we have a clinical vignette, a radiograph showing um, the, the right uh, upper extremity um, of a patient where there is a fracture mid shaft of the humerus. And the vignette states, a 27 year old man injured his right arm in an automobile accident. The radiographic examination revealed a fracture of the shaft of the humerus. One of the questions I would then ask is, given the location of the fracture, what nerve or nerves is our most at risk following this injury? Now, I didn't put this in, um, in a poll everywhere, but anyone, if anyone wants to put it on chat or shout out what the answer is? Just curious. We have uh, one student saying median nerve. Median nerve. That's a good, that's a good uh, answer to bring forward. Anything else? Okay. Another one is answering the radial nerve. The radial nerve. So there's median nerve and radial nerve. Now, when you think of that, so in the interest of time, so we can look at it, I like that someone mentioned the median nerve because this is this image shows the image of um, our nerves that will are some main contributors to our upper extremity. What I'm pointing to, what I'm tracing with the cursor is actually the median nerve. And the median nerve does, does descend down the, uh, um, the arm as it goes into the forearm. And it is quite close to the uh, shaft of the humor. So that's a good answer to consider. The, the individual who answered the radial nerve, that actually is the correct answer. And here is the reason why, because this is something that the students also have to recognize, is there are going to be so many nerves that are going to be located in a certain anatomical region. What they also need to consider is the proximity of a nervous structure, for example, in relation to the structure that's affected, in this case, the humerus. It's, it may not be um, very clear 
But the radial nerve that's colored here in green actually is in very close contact. It wraps around the uh, shaft of the humerus, especially in mid shaft. So because it is closer to the humerus, whereas the median nerve is actually embedded within the muscle. And so it's not in close proximity to the radio, to the uh, humerus, the radial nerve is the best answer in this case. Now, the next question I asked the, the students so that they could start to go through the thought process, especially thinking about anatomy, is as a result of his injury, the patient showed a lack of sweating on the back of the arm and forearm. Identify the location of the cell bodies um, of the damaged nerve fibers involved in the sweating. Now, what this question does is that it has the students think back on prior content that we taught prior to this. And this is actually content taught not only in gross anatomy, but also in histology. Any curiosity as to what the answer is? We have one student saying IMLCC. IMLCC, and so that's actually, a, I like that abbreviation because that's quite, quite long. So that is correct. It is the IMLCC, the anteromedial lateral cell column. Uh, and the reason why this is the answer is because the intermedial uh, lateral cell column is where the preganglionic sympathetic fibers arise. And so the uh, sweating that occurs in the body is through sympathetics. The sympathetics will lead to uh, sweating in, the, in our bodies. And so when there is an, um, if, if a patient shows a lack of sweating, what that could indicate is that uh, the uh, sympathetic chain may have been affected due to a severity of the injury. Because even though it's not seen here very clearly, and while our sympathetic chain is located more closely to the uh, vertebra in the, uh, uh, in the body, in the thorax and the abdomen, in the torso and the abdomen, it actually sends out branches towards uh, its target tissues. And so the sweat glands uh, receive um, sympathetic innervation. Um, and so if these are damaged somehow during the accident, that may have affected the patient. Another question is, nerves travel with arteries. What main artery is at risk with this injury? So we know that the uh, humerus has been fractured. We know that the radial nerve has been damaged or at most at risk. Now, what artery travels with the radial nerve? We have the brachial artery. The brachial artery, that's close. How about if we add a few more adjectives to it? Julian says radial A. Radial artery. We do have a radial artery, and that radial artery is actually located more in the forearm, but that is a good identification. What Samantha it is, says axillary artery. Axillary artery, I like that, <laughs> that artery as well. The um, axillary artery, and I'm glad she, uh, she mentioned it, the axillary artery is this main artery that's depicted in this image right over here. Uh, a part of it, this proximal part is the axillary artery because it actually then becomes the brachial artery. Uh, the axillary artery actually gives off the, um, um, after becoming the brachial artery, it gives off several uh, arteries that will supply the shoulder region and the upper part of the, uh, the uh, extremity. But the brachial artery gives off what we call the uh, profunda brachial artery or the deep artery of the arm. That is one of its main branches. And if you notice the pathway of the profunda brachial artery in this image, it's actually traveling along with the radial nerve. So when the radial nerve is damaged, the artery is at risk. But I want to continue with uh, Julian's response about a radial artery. There is a radial artery. As the brachial artery descends down into the forearm, at the region of the cubital fossa or the space in front of the elbow region, um, the uh, brachial artery, as after it goes below the cubital fossa, will bifurcate or branch off into the radial artery. 
which will be supplying the um, essentially supplying the uh, lateral aspect of our forearm and the uh, ulnar artery. So the radial artery is one of the main arterial branches in our forearm. And you'll notice too that uh, when I'm describing this region, is this is what we uh, have to make sure we explain to our students is when your patient comes to you, if they tell you my arm hurts, you need to ask them or have them point uh, where the arm is because the arm is really just from the shoulder to the elbow and the forearm, because sometimes they just point to the forearm, which is, that, which is uh, what's painful to them, is from the elbow to the wrist. So in relation to this question, the profunda brachial artery is um, at risk uh, should the radial nerve be damaged. And then the final questions I have with this is, after this accident, it is still possible for the patient to supinate the forearm. So by supination, I don't know if you could see me, but when you put your uh, hand in front of you, for example, and you're, it looks like you're cupping your hand, that is a, a supination. Pronation is when you um, uh, have your palm face down. So that's going to be a crossing of your radius over your ulna. So when we think about supination, what muscle or muscles supinate the forearm? Julian says supinator and quadratus, and Samantha answered biceps. Supinator is one of them, and the biceps brachii would be the other, right? Um, so we have half and half for those questions. Now, which of these two, mus these two muscles are innervated by the nerve that's been injured? In this case, it was the radial nerve. So you have the supinator, and the biceps brachii muscle. What do you think? Both, one of them, or none of them at all? That's okay. We have a lot of students uh, saying supinator, and then there's also students saying biceps, so we have like a tie. Okay, that's a good tie. So 50-50. It's too bad I can't give all of you candies from over here, but if I could send you virtual candies, it's actually the supinator muscle. So the supinator muscle is innervated by the radial nerve. So if you notice, again, that if you recall the image, how the radial nerve actually wraps around the uh, uh, shaft of the humerus, it's actually going to end up on the lateral side of the humerus, and then it's going to continue to descend down into the forearm. And when it descends down into the forearm, it sends out a branch that will then innervate or supply the supinator muscle. The biceps brachii muscle is actually, actually served by one of the other nerves from the break, from uh, that branched off of what we call the brachial plexus, and that's the musculocutaneous nerve. So the biceps brachii is actually served by the musculocutaneous. So this one actually just shows you an example. And, and it may seem simplistic right now, but when you are a first year medical student and you have so much information coming in, being able to walk through this process will then help our students when they go further into our other courses in the curriculum where the vignette will no longer be a two sentence vignette. They will start to expand more in terms of their ethnicity, in terms of their, uh, their occupation, um, in terms of any drugs, because by that time, they will already have started to learn the pharmacology, basic pharmacology of certain drug categories. So that's what I do as an educator, as a teacher. Now, a part of my role is in course management. I mentioned earlier that I teach, uh, I help co-direct the Foundations of Medicine course. But I'm also the curriculum director for our pre-matriculation course uh, called MedCamp, which began in 2015. Our we're having our next class coming in, in in the summer of 2021. So as, a, as part of my course management and review um, responsibilities, I assess the effectiveness of the course. Are we teaching the course correctly? Are our faculty providing the feedback that our students need? Um, we want to ensure alignment with the curriculum because we have a specific curriculum that we need to be able to ensure our students 
will be receiving from us. We teach in the pre-clerkship curriculum where they uh, haven't started the clinicals yet. And so we need to provide them the foundation that will help them in the clerkship. And we also evaluate a course performance. Our, is our course doing well? If our course is not doing well, that we, then we need to really, really look at the feedback from our learners, our colleagues, in order to make sure the courses and uh, that we teach are working appropriately. And with all that I'm doing, my research a scholarship in education is to evaluate the, the uh, usefulness of learning activities. So these are two examples of uh, learning activities that I help to implement um, and create for our students. Um, I'm using histology as an example. So in medical histology, we provide uh, pre-lab modules on how to look at and uh, start to identify histological structures before attending the, the lab. They do have some questions associated with it, so they could also use it as a post-lab um, formative feedback. We've also created um, an online lab manual so that the students don't have to print anything out. They'll be able to look at the, uh, um, the, the activities online rather than having a paper print. And in all of this, I do a lot of service, primarily curriculum related. I am a member of the admissions committee. So I do uh, assist in the uh, interview of prospective medical students. I'm involved in several search committees and I'm also one of my favorite jobs really in a sense is a cup of coffee messenger because this speaks to the environment. It speaks to how we are able to maintain professionalism at our institution. But all of this is also tied in with the leadership. Part of my service does include leadership where I am a department head ensuring for the advocacy of the faculty and the staff um, in their professional development, but also that professional development leads to better uh, learning um, outcomes for our students. I'm also one of the leaders for the uh, college's Academy of Distinguished Medical Educators, where again, we're providing some professional development to our faculty in the College of Medicine. Now that's a lot of what I do in just an eight hour day and going in between, so I'm not just oftentimes teaching. So when I think of the challenges as a medical educator, um, these are the challenges, making sure to align the best interest, provide an, an inclusive and positive learning environment, have, um, make sure that there's a building of trust and interprofessional, professional relation, interpersonal professional relationships and maintaining resiliency. No matter what comes after you, we had the pandemic that all of us have experienced, being able to bounce back, being able to bounce back because we need to make sure we are going to, to provide success for our learners, success for our faculty that we work with. That is an important part in this role. And what are the rewards? For me, it's the aha moments when students tell me, I now know what you're talking about. That's good because sometimes I have to think in, in, in alternative ways to help them. The relationships, I build relationships with my students and my faculty and staff. And most importantly is the achievement of the learners and the growth in their confidence and their identity. Helping them know that no, you do not have imposter syndrome. What you have really is you are in a time where you're building your identity to become a physician to become a nurse, to become um, an occupational therapist, no matter what your profession is. Now, what does it mean to start that journey? It's just a single slide, but these are some areas I want you to consider because to become a medical educator, it could be whatever health profession you're interested in. You want to ensure that you have mentoring, you self-reflect so that you know where you want to go, Invest in professional development, even at your age right now. Leadership skills, how do I collaborate and communicate? One of the most important things is to have a support system, someone that you can turn to when you want guidance. Collaborate with each other, especially when we think about that no man is an island. We can't really just do things on our own. And embrace your professional identity, who you want to be. So when you have that, the success and achievements may be small, but they do build. And you will be able to see yourself 
five, six, 10 years from now that from a learner, I am a health professional. If you have any questions, please feel free to contact me and I'm open to any questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Chico. That was a truly wonderful presentation. Um, I honestly um, loved seeing um, your journey uh, as, um, as a learner to become an educator, right? So if you're okay with that, we can begin um, with the Q&A session right yes, now. I'll go ahead and stop sharing. So hopefully I can see everyone. Oh yeah, for sure. Okay. Wonderful. Oh, I would also um, love if you could send your email to the students through the chat so they can contact sure, yes. you if they have any other questions later on. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so the first question is, um, how did you navigate the transition from a student to a teacher? How did I navigate it? Well, as I mentioned earlier, when I ask, how do you view yourself as a mentor? When I was in high school and in college, I tutored. I was tutoring. Sometimes it was just, can you help me? And so I helped in that. So after I, when I was in graduate school and I became more involved in, in um, teaching, uh, after taking the, uh, the Gross Anatomy and Histology courses, it's, it was a natural progression to become a teacher in a sense that uh, I was eventually having many didactic sessions with my classmates. And so, one of the, the adages or the, yeah, the, the um, quotes that came to mind was the best way to learn material is to teach it yourself. And it's also one of the reasons why uh, myself and our faculty and what we do here and what most uh, med medical colleges promote is peer teaching. So being able to teach a certain concept to your peers will help you learn the material better. So it was a natural flow from what I've, what I've done as a tutor and then um, in graduate school because I've taken um, gross anatomy histology and being asked to help the medical students and students at other health professions. I and eventually just started teaching them, putting together PowerPoints. And well, at that point it wasn't PowerPoint. We were still using uh, um, uh, slides in the carousel. <laughs> PowerPoints are relatively new, so to speak. You can see how old I am just by taking that. I love that. I love that, that you're speaking that, you know, in a sense, it was truly just within you uh, the whole time, the, the teaching um, part. It was just within you since undergrad, and I love it. Um, so another question is, oh, this is this is actually um, really interesting. Um, how do you know when you've chosen the right path? Are there any choices you regret making? And is there such a thing as a waste of time? So this is three questions from the same um, audience member, but you know, you okay. can ask them. <laughs> so I might ask you to repeat the question. So the first one is, how do I know I've chosen the, the, the right path? Correct. Okay, so hopefully I won't receive a cup of coffee for what I'm going to state. Um, but when, when I, at the end of the day, after a day where there were a lot of frustrations, and yes, there are sometimes, especially when you have to do, when you're involved in multiple things, there is the potential for, for um, a person to feel um, frustrated with what's going on and that's okay but it's a matter of how you deal with that at the end of the day when I just sit down take a deep breath and realize you know what I could wake up again the next day and go to work I could wake up again even after staying up till two o'clock in the morning and I have an eight o'clock class to give I am ready to do that that excitement tells me that I am in the right place because um don't get me wrong, I love research. I love bench research. I enjoy being able to um, manipulate uh, peptides or manipulate uh, proteins in order to ensure that they could cross a blood-brain barrier, for example. But then when it starts to become busy work, that's when I realized this is not for me. 
Um, so that's how I, how I know that what I'm doing is because despite all the frustrations in the day, I'm, I want to go to work the next day or I go to school the next day if, in, in, in that case. So what was the second question again, please? Okay, so the next question was, are there any choices you regret making on that line? Um, are there any choices? There have been some choices that, yes, there are going to be choices that I regret. Uh, one, in, one of them sometimes when it's, uh, why didn't I, I, I accept um, applying to a fellowship or a scholarship? in order to proceed and do a career. Part of it was, um, and so this is a personal, this, is, this reflects who I am as an introvert because I, I am by nature an introvert, that there were times when I didn't want to step out of my box. And so when I do not do that because of the fear of failure, so I am very, very aware of my learners my students when they are they tell me they're afraid to fail because I have experienced that even as a graduate student and even uh, as a postdoc and right now if I fail to grab something that's been open to me because I'm afraid to go beyond that oh wow I love that that's that's really deep <laughs> um so the next one along that line um is there such a thing as a waste of time your opinion is there such a thing as a waste of time in what context please because it depends on the context okay it was it was a lot of the same question so the, this person asked how do you know when you've chosen the right path are there any choices you regret making and the last question they asked uh was is there such a thing as a waste of time related to my regarding your profession uh regarding my profession i would say I think that's what they meant. I don't know. If they okay. All right. Um, <laughs> yes. And by that, I would say meetings. Sometimes we're meeting out. We have so many meetings to go through that it's, uh, <laughs> it's um, why do we need to do this? But sometimes I, there's the, a, a little small kernel of I'm going to learn something at a meeting. And whether it's a meeting related to what I do as part of my profession or when I go to conferences, I love to go to conferences. That ties in with my, my love for travel. I, I, I'll tell you right now, I love to travel um, and experience new things. And that's, that's probably what a lot of us like to do, being a traveler, because when you search your profession, you're actually a traveler. So when I go to a conference and I'm so excited to go to an educational conference and then I read a title of a talk and I go to that talk and I'm thinking, well, that doesn't, that doesn't sound like your abstract. Um, so yes, in a sense, there are time, there are times where you there are uh, it may see it may seem wasteful, but a lot of it has to do with what you are looking for. So the the uh, the conference meeting or session that I've gone to may not have been useful to me but it could be useful to you because it would be helping you in a certain um, area of your development. So it, it's actually person or individual dependent, but that's also tied in in what is my, my growth mindset? Where do I want to go? Oh yeah, I, I definitely agree. Okay, so um, another um, member of our audience asks, Seeing the impact you create on the students you teach, how has this influenced you as an educator? I love that question because um, one of the things that I recognize in myself to make sure I help our students succeed is I have to be continuously improving myself to continuously learn, which it, it, and that means also learning best practices and teaching. And so when students tell me that I've impacted them in terms of helping them get through a course, helping them to understand a concept or just talking to them, just listening to them, most importantly, being a good listener and helping them go to a different direction, that impacts me by changing my, how I relate to them. 
hopefully it's a more positive relationship with them because at the heart of it, to me, is the relationships with my colleagues, my students, because they will eventually be my colleagues once they graduate. I love that. Thank, thank you. Um, I believe that's that's wonderful. Yeah, like I love how how you talk so much about working on yourself first as a professional in order to help others. I, I think that's wonderful, honestly. Um, so another question is, in regards to your work with peptide translocation, what would you say were your most exciting or surprising findings? And how did you deal with any setbacks within your experiment? So when, with that work, um, one of my most exciting findings was that uh, there are, um, I worked with uh, gonadotropin releasing hormone uh, and sometimes it was so frustrating to be able to bring them across a blood brain barrier. And so being able to see that the correct, or the correct uh, identifying the correct sequence of a translocating peptide, especially after working several weeks and cell culture doing high performance uh, liquid chromatography. And then, oh, by the way, I need to go to the gross anatomy lab and dissect <laughs> to help in my teaching, to be able to recognize that just by switching um, uh, uh, one of the sequences, one of the amino acids is what makes it exciting. And then how did I deal with with setbacks with my exper experiment, I deal with that by going back and reflecting on, first off, what were the steps that I did? And uh, did I also follow the uh, literature that I based my experiments on? And so sometimes it's a matter of making sure that what I wrote in my lab notebook was, was correct or incorrect. If, if it wasn't anything I wrote, and this is also where I need to, this is where being able to feel comfortable and talking to my advisor is needed. Because if I cannot speak to my advisor, tell my advisor that this is what I did and also acknowledge the mistakes that I made, he would not have been able to guide me on where I need to look. So that is how I set, how I deal with setbacks in my experiments when that happens. Thank you. Okay, so another question from our audience is, I am trying to be a physical therapist, but I am only in ninth grade. What things could I do to prepare myself both academically and personally? Okay, so with uh, to become a physical therapist, one of the first things I would recommend is um, See if you, if you know a physical therapist in your community or um, know if you go into the hospital and in the volunteer in the hospital and ask if there's anyone who's doing um, physical therapy, ask if you could speak with them and learn about what they are doing day by day. This is the advice I give for any health profession, pre-health professional students who want to go into physical therapy or medical school or dental school is uh, make time to learn what everyone is doing. What is their job? Because I'll tell you this, when I interview medical students and one of the questions I would inevitably ask is, why, med why, why a physician? Why not physical therapy? Why not nursing? You're helping, you're helping the community. So you have to be able to distinguish between them. And so to prepare yourself, um, uh, academically at least, is go into your classes as if that is your favorite class. Though I'll tell you personally, geometry was never my favorite class. <laughs> but go in as if it's your favorite class and um, ask questions. If something does not make sense, do not be afraid to ask questions. And if you are... If, if working in groups help you, work with someone you feel comfortable with um, in, in learning the content. And um, personally, 
to prepare for uh, any health professions, um, make sure you have a support system in, uh, around you. And also make sure there is someone you could talk to. Because if you are in an environment where someone tells you you cannot do this, step back and tell you, and you should know that you could do this. That is one of the things that, um, uh, especially for those of us who are of color or of a different um, gender that is not the majority in a community, that is a time to uh, be proactive in, in what you're seeking. Even if it's in, in the world, in the realm of Zoom right now, if you know someone in a different uh, continent, in a different state that you're comfortable talking with and helping you and advising you, talk to them and ask them as, can, can you be someone who could mentor me? So I would also recommend looking for mentors to help you, even as, as a ninth grader, being able to find a mentor is important. You don't have to keep that same mentor because it is important that we have to be able to grow, but someone that you could talk to right now. Thank you so much, doctor. You're welcome. Okay, so as student or educator, what has been the most interesting project you have done or worthwhile your experience you have? Oh, one of my most interesting project thus far um, is actually MedCamp. So MedCamp, um, which is a pre-matriculation program. So when we have our, our class of M1s coming in who selected uh, Texas A&M, we then would ask um, uh, if anyone are interested in joining MedCamp for three weeks out of the summer. It, it is an application based and we, we accept a, a certain number of students just by nature of the resources. But working and collaborating with our academic success faculty and staff, our diversity, um, equity and inclusion committee members to establish a curriculum that not only introduces our first year medical students and what it means to be a medical student, but also help them in their study, study strategy skills, um, um, introduce them to leadership skills and introduce them to uh, their faculty that they will meet in the first semester. To me, that was one of the most interesting and worthwhile experience because it's ongoing. We're further developing them and our former med campers that we like, as we like to call them, they return in our mentors to incoming matriculants and they help out our students, help them transition into medical school. That is one of the most interesting and worthwhile experiences. One of many. That sounds really, really <laughs> interesting. Okay, so what would you tell someone who wants to go into psychiatry to explain why they need to know girls' anatomy? Oh, okay. So psychiatry, why do you want to know? Is because you have, you, as a psychiatrist, you would also be, um, um, I'm blanking out on a term, I'm getting a brain fart right now, <laughs> prescribe, okay? You're going to be prescribing them drugs. And so you, the drugs that you prescribe them for someone who's depressed, or they might have some other psychological, um, psych psychological uh, um, or psychiatric uh, diagnosis, you have to know what part, what um, body parts will be affected. It does go eventually, and it has to pass through the liver, because the liver is where we detoxify the uh, um, the uh, contents we take in, especially our drugs. And so, being able to assess the the uh, anatomical relationships around the liver, because if you damage the liver, um, there is and you and that involves having to do surgery you need to be able to know where in the body the surgeon will be impacting. And psychiatry does also involve the neuroanatomy. Where, is the, where are the uh, um, 
brain centers, um, primary centers for, uh, for personality, right? For speech control, for being able to, to write. And if we think too that if we have a dementia, dementia, uh, what happens is an individual diagnosed with dementia, their brain um, will start to shrink, right? The, there's going to be greater spaces in the grooves. And if you have a person with dementia, that could then affect the other functions of the body. So you'll have to be able to know the human body and the foundations and the, the anatomical relationships as a psychiatrist or any specialty because you're prescribing drugs or examining them. When your patient comes in, you're not just going to say, okay, talk to me. There's always a little bit of uh, examination that, go that goes on. Oh, yeah, of course, I completely agree. Definitely, anatomy is one of the most important um, courses that any pre-health um, student or any health professional needs to understand. Maybe not thoroughly, but up to a certain point, very close to thoroughly. <laughs> You actually bring up a good point, Jesus. Um, gross anatomy is the foundational sciences that all our health professional students need to know. The, the depth of what they know need to know will be dependent on their specialty. But you still, we still need to know what's going on in the human body. Because when you look at new literature out there, especially with new diagnostics that includes drugs or new diagnostics that includes um, that includes imaging. We have to be able to know what we're looking at and what's being affected with our, our new technologies, new innovations in healthcare. Oh, for sure, I completely agree. Okay, so I think we're almost ready to wrap up. So I'm gonna ask two uh, more questions and then we'll be wrapping up this session. So this one, okay, so a member of our audience asks, how did you get into the topic of neuroscience as, as part of your work? Oh, um, neuroscience came into play because uh, with gross anatomy, we also learned the neuroanatomy of the brain. And so I also, in the, I also teach in our neuroscience block, but mostly in the neuro, neuroanatomy component in that regard. And my cell, the cell biology program at UTMB we not only uh, took gross anatomy, but uh, histology and neuroscience as part of our coursework. So the brain is part of our human body and it's a nice extension. Okay, I love that. <laughs> okay, so um, the last question would be, to teach as a postdoc, does one still need to get a teaching certification? That is a interesting question because um, as a postdoc, I didn't have a teaching certification. Um, I, it, what it was is because I already had experience in the area and um, being asked to teach as a postdoc uh, gave me that opportunity to, to become more involved in teaching in, in the medical school. Um, however, that being said, for a postdoc who then wants to teach at the K to 12 arena, they definitely do have to receive a teaching certification because there are certain criteria that needs to be met for each um, independent school district. But as a postdoc, um, you don't necessarily, or they're not, often, uh, they're not often asked to have a teaching certification. But I do want to, to mention this. If a postdoc or even a graduate student or college student has the opportunity to um, take, take some courses or workshops on how to teach, I highly recommend it because I started teaching at a time where um, as a faculty member, as a junior faculty, sometimes we're just asked to start teaching. And not all early career faculty have the skills to teach. So if you have the opportunity to do so, I would recommend um, doing that. So for example, here at Texas A&M, our College of Medicine is part of the Texas A&M University. We have a Center for Teaching Excellence, 
where they have a program for our undergraduate and graduate students as well as our postdocs to take in order to help learn teaching skills, how to be an effective teacher, how to put together assessments, how to put together a course syllabus. And so that's something I would look into so that when you go into the area that you want to teach, biochemistry, microbiology, immunology, you already know what it means to put together a syllabus, to write a, write a set of questions and to teach effectively. Thank you so much. I believe that's actually very beneficial. Yeah, I, I believe a lot of colleges need to adopt that sort of um, courses because yeah, I do believe it's very, very beneficial <laughs> for students <laughs> and also um, teachers right on the college level. Okay, and so, job prospects too. Oh, for sure, for sure. Like teaching is definitely a necessary skill, no matter um, your field, I believe. Like, I, I think you, everyone should be able to transmit knowledge in any given way, at least, you know, in a good way <laughs> to, <laughs> other, to other people. <laughs> Okay, so thank you so much once again, Dr. Chico. So I think we are ready to wrap up. I'll be presenting my wrapping up slides so we can um, finish. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, here we go. So we can be done with our live session today. So I definitely believe um, we all learned a lot from, from our wonderful, like, speaker at least I know I did <laughs> I hope you guys this I hope you guys did too um so considering this we would like to encourage every single one um every single member attending this session today to reflect um on these three questions that we have over here so what brought you today to the session what are three major takeaways that you got from it and what do you want to learn more about you can answer these questions on your mind. You can answer on them on paper. You can think about them. Just let them sink in. <laughs> of course, we want to um, highlight that this the writing of these questions and answering them is not um, required. However, we encourage you all to submit it to our website for publication, for recognition of your hard work, and to enhance your future applications, as we mentioned earlier. Once again, if you want to learn more about pre shadowing and how to get involved in our program, we encourage you to visit our website. You can become an asynchronous volunteer to get certified hours, professional nominations, graphic design, and social media promotion. And we are also accepting team member applications if you want to take on a more active role in PHS to lead projects and initiatives to be up here with us. Once again, we are humbly asking that if you're financially able to donate, that you please consider sending um, a few dollars to us via Venmo or PayPal, however you prefer. It costs a lot to keep our program up and running and free to all of you. So if you are someone who can afford to, or if you know someone else who can, please support those who cannot by donating to our organization so everyone can continue to get the education they deserve. Otherwise, we simply ask you to spread the word about pre-health shadowing to reach as many students as possible. Now, the part that you've all been waiting for, I'm sure, <laughs> earning a digital certificate for the virtual shadowing hours from this session today. So the first step is you're gonna go onto our website and find our professional course pages. In this case, it would be Dr. Chico's page. Next, you can take our quick 10 question multiple choice quiz based on the content from the session today. You will have 30 minutes per attempt to earn 70% or higher to get your certificate. We know, of course, that sometimes technology can be difficult. And for this reason, we allow up to two attempts to take the assessment. But if you run into any difficulties, please do not hesitate to contact us so we can help you. To ensure that our website does not crash from a high influx of students, we recommend waiting from 30 minutes to an hour after the session to take the quiz 
which I want to highlight will be open indefinitely. So you can take it anytime you want. And finally, once you have passed, you can click the finish course button at the bottom of the professionals page and download your certificate verifying your virtual shadowing hours. If unfortunately you missed part of the session or you want to go back and view other sessions to earn more certificates with verified virtual shadowing hours, you can go to our YouTube channel and watch our previous recordings. You can also find them via the professional pages on our website and take the post shadowing assessment for these as well. Be sure to follow us on social media or subscribe to our email list for the latest updates on upcoming sessions and events. We are currently booked every single weekday through June for virtual shadowing sessions, so we definitely hope to see you guys over there. Once again, thank you all for joining us today, and please stick around if you have any questions whatsoever, and myself and other team, team members will be happy to answer them. The shadowing session is officially over, 